All right, it's wonderful to see everybody. Hopefully you got a handout in the back of the room. And let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of forgiveness. We thank you for our fellowship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can gather together physically and remember who we are as your people, that we can turn our attention to your word when we could be doing a hundred other things, O oh Lord. You, you call us to set aside this time to worship you, to encourage one another, uh, to confess sin to you, to find forgiveness in Christ. And we thank you that all of this is revealed to us uh, through your powerful word. We know that we are transformed by your word as the Holy Spirit takes it and works it into our heart and reveals uh, dimensions of sin in our life and assures us of your grace. Uh, Father, this is what we need this morning. And so we pray that as we turn our attention to the blessing and the privilege of having your word in our hands, that we would not take it for granted, but that we would eagerly feed upon your word and lift our eyes to the heaven of heavens where Christ is seated at your right hand, that we would walk through this world with spiritual eyes and that we would press on for the upward prize of the call of God that is in Christ Jesus, knowing that it is you who has first laid hold upon us for your own glory. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, as we turn our attention to the privilege of the Christian life this morning, the Bible, I want you to know that I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. Uh, this is a church that loves the Bible. This is a church that loves the Bible because as a church, you hold the Bible as the Word of God. You not only have the Bible, you hold the Bible. and You know that it is the very Word of God. How are we going to examine the Bible as a pri privilege of the Christian life? Uh, the Bible is God's redemptive Word to us. It is the way we come to know God in a saving way. It is how we come to learn that we we are created as the image of God. Uh, it is how we understand that God overrules all things by His providence. Whatever privilege we're talking about when we talk about the Christian life, we learn about it from the Bible. So no sooner do we talk about the Bible as a privilege of the Christian life than all the other privileges of the Christian life come rushing in. So, again, I ask, how are we going to talk about the Bible as a Christian privilege. Well, what I want to do is explore what the Bible is. And you might think, that's not going to take very long. Uh, but have no fear, I can make it take a long time. Uh, what the Bible is, what are some of its attributes? We usually think of attributes as attributes of God, but there are some classic attributes of the Bible that were forged during the Reformation that I want to examine with you briefly. And then we're going to take up one particular attribute, uh, the attribute of the Bible's sufficiency. Because I think it's in studying the Bible's sufficiency that we actually come to, to recognize uh, the Bible as such a great privilege. We could look at other attributes as well, and we will, but want to take a close look at sufficiency. So, number one, uh, what is the Bible? And by the way, I'm going to try to have a little more time for discussion and questions and comments. So I'm going to keep my eye on the clock. What is the Bible? The Bible is a book. In fact, that's what the word Bible means. It comes from the medieval Latin term biblia, which means book. But of course, it's, it's not just a book. It's actually a book of books. It has 66 books, to be exact. Uh, these are divided into two groups. The first group is made up of the first uh, 39 books, and it is called the Old Testament. And the remaining 27 books is called the New Testament. And in broad strokes, the Old Testament deals with a period of history from creation all the way up to the coming, almost, of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, the New Testament deals with the life of Christ 2,000 years ago and uh, the life of the early church just after Christ's death and resurrection and ascension. What's amazing is that these 66 books, these two testaments, uh, were written by about 40 different human authors, uh, writing in at least three different languages over the span of about 40 generations. And you would think, sneaking behind me, I was worried about a sabotage from behind. You would think that with all of this data, the Bible would be chaos. I mean, think about it. 40 different authors, three different languages over 40 generations. It would be cacophony. It would be chaos. And yet, the Bible is so compelling as an organically integrated and coherent book that it remains the best-selling book of all time. Estimates are that over 7 billion copies of the Bible have been sold. Uh, even 3.9 billion in the last 50 years, which is amazing. Anybody want to take a guess at what the second best-selling book is after the Bible? Any guesses? It is... That's close. Mein Kampf was a good guess. Quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong, the little red book. Uh, number three, Harry Potter. <laughs> Depending on how you count the series or maybe the first book. I don't know. But it's Bible, Mao Zedong, Hogwarts. Okay? <laughs> the Bible has been translated into more than 350 languages. Part of the Bible at least being translated into over 3,300 languages. Active translations taking place in over 2,600 languages. The Bible deals with the origin of everything. It deals with the future of everything. And as you know, it centers on one topic, God and his dealings with human beings in time and space. And more specifically, it centers on the person and work of Jesus Christ, of the divine Son of God who, out of love, has won salvation for all who would trust in him. And he offers that salvation through the Bible to every man, woman, boy, and girl on the planet. Well, the Bible is more than just a book about God and his dealings. It is, as you know, the very word of God. It is the very Word of God. And to examine how it is the Word of God, what, what exactly is the shape of the Bible as the Word of God, I want to look at this text on your handout, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. This is an architectonic, to use a big word, verse in the Bible. It's, a, it's an overarching perspective on God's revelation to human beings in time and space. And if we can get a handle on Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, I think we'll be in a better position to understanding what the Bible is beyond just saying it's the Word of God. Okay, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Let me read it for us. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Okay, you can just hear those two verses, and since this is an umbrella declaration, this is, a, this is a Mount Everest perspective on God's revelation across time. The controlling reality throughout these two texts is that God has spoken. God has spoken. God's speech is the unifying reality across the entire time span that's in view here. God's speech. Notice, long ago at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by a son. So God's speech governs both eras. But no sooner do we say both eras than we understand that Hebrews 1 has in view God's speech 
across history. So God reveals himself, he speaks, but he doesn't say everything at once. His speech unfolds across history. It unfolds through time. Notice the author of Hebrews distinguishes between long ago and in these last days. God's speech comes to human beings long ago and in these last days. Now when we When we talk about God's speech coming across history, we mean mean God's special verbal revelation. Of course, the Bible teaches that all of creation reveals God's power and wisdom and righteousness. You can look at Romans chapter 1 or Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. So when we're talking about God's speech across history, we have in view what theologians call special revelation. Special revelation. Anybody want to take a shot at what God's revelation through nature is called generally in the Reformed tradition? General (laughs) revelation. Very good. General revelation. We're talking about God's special revelation. If we really want to be careful about special revelation, we're going to see that it is dealing with both word and deed. Special revelation covers not only the the verbal self-disclosure of God, but also his activity in time and space. Here the focus is on God's speech. Though you can kind of, if you think about it, when God acts in history, he's also speaking, as it were. He's revealing something about himself and his purposes. Okay, God's speech across history. Third, The author notes that God's speech across history comes through human means. Through human means. Long ago, many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers, notice, by the prophets. Now, I would argue that in Hebrews, this word prophets in this context refers to any human agent of God's self-revelation, not just prophets specifically who were God's appointed mouthpieces to speak to his people, but but any way God used human beings to reveal his own character and purpose uh, to man. He uses human beings. Um, What is so fascinating here is that as God uses human beings, what the Bible clearly teaches is that God doesn't just give an idea to his mouthpieces and then lets them work it out on their own, however they like. No, the very speech of God's human messengers is identified with the Word of God because it is the Word of God. And uh, I don't have a handout that you have in front of me, but um, Exodus 4.15 Remember, he calls Moses to be his messenger to Pharaoh. And, 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 and Moses says, I'm not a good speaker. And he says, I'm going to bring Aaron. And he's like, don't choose me. And God says, I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And God is saying, I am going to guide your mouth as you speak to Pharaoh. And if we were to go even clearer, I love this verse, Jeremiah 1.9. Jeremiah 1.9 is glorious because God says, I have put my words in your mouth. So God is putting his own speech on the tongues of his messengers, using their personalities, using their background, organically using all that they are to speak the words in his appointed time and place. But as they speak, they are speaking the very words of God. So that, so that when, when Jeremiah speaks, it is just as much the very word of God. When he's, when he's speaking in his office of prophet, it is the very speech of God just as much as God's thundering voice from the top of Mount Sinai. 
the prophet speaks with divine authority. Number four, these human means across history imply that when they speak God's words, there is a diversity in what they speak. They speak at many times and in many ways. God's speech is variegated. It is pluriform. It's all organically related. It's all connected. There's no contradiction in it, but it's, but it's not monolithic. It's not monochromatic. It's, it's wildly diverse, gloriously, organically diverse. It's diverse not just because God uses many human mouthpieces, but ultimately, God's word is unified in its diversity because, guess what? That's what God is. He's unified in his diversity. He is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when he speaks, he speaks with glorious diversity, all organically related. How is it organically related? with a focus on Christ. My handwriting is breaking down. Got some wild organic diversity going on on the board. God's speech is a Christ-centered speech in history. His special revelation post-fall is all oriented to Christ. Now this doesn't come out super clearly in Hebrews 1, 1, and 2, but let's pair Hebrews 1, 1, and 2 with Hebrews 3, 5 and 6. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews 3, 5 and 6. It says this, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, notice this, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Moses, the preeminent prophet of the Old Testament, was a servant in God's house-building purpose and he testified to the things that were to be spoken later. If we understand the things to be spoken later, in light of Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, we understand that those things have to do with the Son of God, the one come in the flesh, the final speech of God, the very Word of God in the flesh to us. So Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 is talking about a wild piecemeal diversity. I should stop saying wild because that implies chaos and it's not chaotic. But there's, there's a rich, diverse, piecemeal revelation of God in the Old Testament prior to the coming of Christ that has to do with Christ as its center. And then finally, when God speaks in Jesus himself, this is the final climactic word now for us. Jesus Christ is the center of God's special revelation, and he is the climax of God's special revelation. Jesus is not just God's last word or latest word to us. Jesus is the final word. He is the last word. To us. He's spoken in a son, the son who is God himself. There's, there's no more that God needs to say to us concerning our redemption other than giving us Jesus Christ. Okay, with all this in mind, what is the Bible? Well, if we gather up this history of special revelation through human means with organic diversity leading up to and centering on Jesus Christ, Here's my mouthful about what the Bible is. And you can see it on your handout. The Bible, and, and having done this, hopefully you, you know every part of what I'm about to say. The Bible is the inspired record, or we could say the revelatory record. It is revelation. It's part of this history. But this, the Bible, is the revelatory or inspired record of the history of, of special revelation centered on God's accomplishment of salvation for his people with the work of the incarnate Christ at its core. So, so the Bible is 
a record, but it's a revealed record. It's the God's Word record. It's the revelatory record of the history starting at creation, leading up to Christ, and then the aftermath. The history of God's special revelation centered on the accomplishment of our salvation, the once-for-all work of Jesus with the work of Christ at its core. Okay, let me just pause right there. Questions about that description about the Bible. It's a little more detailed than just saying it's the Word of God, which is true. But we want to understand the historical character, the dynamic unfolding of history and God's revelation in history now as it has been deposited for us in the Bible. Questions, comments about this so far? Okay. Okay, now that we have this revelatory record of the history of special revelation in our hands, what are some of its attributes? As we think about this being such a privilege that we have the history of special revelation deposited for us in the Bible with the work of Jesus as its center and climax. Well, I'm going to skip sufficiency for now because we're going to get to that in just a minute. But, by the way, (laughs) these four attributes... Maybe this will blow somebody's mind here. Maybe you're going to think this is not a big deal. I remember I learned this after I had been examined by my presbytery, and somebody told me this, and I was like, that would have been really helpful to know. So (laughs) anyway, snap. It's a snap, okay? Or you could do pans or naps or... (laughs) Whatever you like, but snap, okay? Sufficiency, necessity, authority, and the worst word to describe clarity, perspicuity. Uh, Perspicuity is the least clear word that means the Bible is essentially clear. Okay, necessity. How is the Bible necessary? In what sense is it necessary? Well, let's go back to the distinction between special and general revelation. General revelation reveals God's power, His righteousness, His wisdom. But one thing general revelation does not ever give you is the gospel message. Nature tells you a lot about God, inescapably. But a sunset does not tell me Jesus loves me, this I know, because it's the Bible that tells me so. Uh, The Bible is necessary if we are to have redemptive revelation from God. Nature gives us non-redemptive revelation from God. In fact, the Bible says, Romans 1, that because of our fallen hearts, we know God through nature but we suppress that knowledge in unrighteousness. And so what nature blares to us is that God exists, that he is righteous, that he is judge. And and it holds us accountable to God in our sin and leaves us without excuse. That's what nature plus our fallen hearts, that's where it leaves us. It leaves us inexcusable for the king of heaven. We know we belong to God. We know we're his image. We know he's righteous and perfect, but we have... No, need, no way to be reconciled to him apart from his redemptive word. So first sense the Bible's necessary is it's necessary if we are to be saved. It's necessary if we are to be saved. It is not necessary in the sense that God had to give it to us. God could have left us in our sin. He could have chosen not to give us redemptive special revelation. He could, have, he could have judged us. But no, God opens up the new way, right? He establishes the covenant of grace. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. He opens up the door to knowing him in an unbreakable bond of fellowship, and he does it through special revelation that's redemptive. And then that special revelation has been deposited for us in the Bible. Francis Turretin wonderful Reformed theologian, says this, God indeed was not bound to the Scriptures, but He has bound us to them. Authority. God's authority in the Bible. Westminster 1.4, 
the authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. The authority of Scripture derives from the God who wrote it. And God is truth itself. And God has put his authority in the very words of the Bible. So the reason that the Bible is authoritative, another way to put it, is because the Bible is inspired. 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. We, we typically use the word inspired, not just that the Bible is inspiring, like you listen to a great song, you feel really inspired, but inspired in the sense that the Holy Spirit carried along the writers of the Bible to write precisely those words that God determined, such that the words they wrote are God's words. Inspired is a wonderful word. We talk about the inspiration of Scripture, but technically what this word here in 1 Timothy 3.16 has in mind is that the Bible is expired. This prefix meaning breathed out. The Bible is God's word breathed out by the Spirit from his mouth. So the very words of the Bible are God's words. Again, Jeremiah 1.9, the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Um, John Calvin, great reformer in Geneva, is battling against the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church functionally was teaching that the Bible has authority because the church says so. It is the church that actually gives the Bible its authoritative function in the lives of God's people. It's the church that, that teaches what the Bible says. And Calvin is rebutting this idea, and he's saying, no, our ultimate authority is not the Pope or the church over the Bible, but it's the Bible itself. The Bible has its own intrinsic authority. The Bible is authoritative by virtue of what it is namely the Word of God. And so he writes this, and I've got a portion of it on your handout. Let me back up to what's not on your handout. He says this, While the church receives and gives its seal of approval to the Scriptures, it does not thereby render authentic what is otherwise doubtful or controversial. When the Bible says this is the Word of God, Calvin is saying the, Bible doesn't, the, the church doesn't make the Bible the Word of God. But because the church, here's the key word, recognizes Scripture to be the truth of its own God, as a pious duty, it unhesitatingly venerates Scripture. Now listen to this. As to their question, that is, Roman Catholics, as to their question, how can we be assured that this has sprung from God unless we have recourse to the decree of the church? How are we to know it's the word of God unless the Pope says so? This is Calvin's answer. It is as if someone asked, Whence will we learn to distinguish light from darkness, white from black, sweet from bitter? Indeed, Scripture exhibits fully as clear evidence of his own truth as white and black things do of their color or sweet and bitter things do of their taste. Calvin says, you want to know whether this is the word of God? Just read it. Now, of course, it gets more complicated because in our sin, we want to reject it. We want to say this is not the word of God. There are many people who would do that. But Calvin is saying when the Spirit takes this word and applies it to our hearts, it carries to the heart of the Christian its own authority. And it demonstrates that authority in the way that it applies to all of life, in the way that it convicts of sin, in the way that it leads us to God. Okay, one more attribute. And maybe we'll do sufficiency next time. <laughs> perspicuity or clarity. Now again, perspicuity, not the greatest word, but 
It's a good word, perspicuity. One theologian writes this, in a world where cultural and religious pluralism are non-negotiable realities, the claim that we are capable of gaining access to universally valid truths, indeed the notion of absolute truth itself, is highly problematic. It smacks of imperialism and bigotry. It would compel you to use words like no and wrong in a world where some argue that these words are themselves violations of the rights of others. Now, this was written a while back. We can say in our own day that using words like no and wrong are actually taken by some today as acts of violence, as assaults on the dignity of another person, as a personal attack, as hate speech. And yet, this attribute of the Bible, its perspicuity or its clarity, needs all the emphasis that we can give it. We have to understand this attribute of the Bible in its proper perspective. The prevailing notion today is that anytime you make an assertion of truth, by definition, that is simply an attempt to gain power over somebody. Not only is it an attempt to gain power over somebody, but when you make an assertion of truth, it's believed today, you're always doing so out of your own social location, your own finite perspective, your own horizon of understanding. And so not only is it a power grab to make an assertion of truth, It's a power grab from someone who is, by definition, limited in their own perspective. And so the antidote today is, number one, to recognize the power dynamics at work in all claims of truth, to try to deconstruct those power dynamics, and to be chastened in understanding that no one ever can ever claim to know anything absolutely. That we all need our counterbalancing perspectives, assertions from the lived experience of others uh, to inform and chasten and teach us. Okay, what makes this so difficult is because there are grains of truth that we need to grab hold on in this perspective. Uh, Our postmodern world has a grain of truth in it when it recognizes that sometimes truth is used in a manipulative way. And sometimes people are seeking to gain control over others. And sometimes uh, that can be very uh, belittling and oppressing to others. Number two, there's a grain of truth, certainly, that we are finite, that we don't know everything, that we need to learn from others, that we need the voices of other people to teach us things. But we can't take these principles and bring them to the Bible and say, therefore, we must interpret the Bible as we would any other book. We must assume that the author has some sort of um, agenda at work that's, that's deleterious, that's dangerous, that needs to be deconstructed and exposed. The Bible does have an agenda. God does have an agenda. But we have to remember the necessity and authority when we come to perspicuity. God is independent. He is all-sufficient. He is authoritative, and he's good. And in him there is no darkness at all. And so when he speaks to us, though we might be fallen and though we might be finite, when God speaks his words to people, He speaks with essential clarity and essential authority. And we are, as his people, to receive his word in that light. So what does perspicuity mean? It does not mean that the Bible is everywhere equally clear. Uh, Thankfully, 
Peter writes, 2 Peter 3.16. There's some things in Paul that are difficult to understand. We say amen to that. Um, perspicuity does not mean everything is equally clear, nor does the attribute of perspicuity mean that everything will be immediately clear to everyone. Some of us have to work harder to understand what the Bible says. So there are some parts in the Bible are, are clearer than other parts, and then we come to the Bible with different levels of apprehension, different levels of biblical knowledge. Uh, we have different experiences that may color how we read the Bible, that make it, make it more difficult to understand certain sections of it. So perspicuity doesn't mean immediate clarity nor universal clarity. But I've been using this word, let me make it explicit. What perspicuity teaches is that the central features of the Bible's message, the guts of Scripture, the center of Scripture, the climax of Scripture, is sufficiently clear so that everyone, and here's the language from the Westminster Confession, through a due use of the ordinary means, may attain a sufficient understanding of those things. A due use of the ordinary means. That means Scripture's perspicuity is meant to dovetail with all the means of grace that God has given to His church. Faithful Bible study, prayer, a posture of humility before the text, sitting under the preaching of God's Word week to week, fellowship in the body. Through these means, the diligent, inquirer of Scripture may attain a sufficient, not a comprehensive knowledge, but a sufficient understanding of the central features of the Bible. God has given us His Word that we might understand it, and that we might believe it, and that we might obey it. So we need to bring what we know about God, His character, His authority, his power, and we need, to, we need to wisely critique the postmodern voices that would say, you can never say, thus saith the Lord. Because the Bible is full of thus saith the Lord. The Bible is thus saith the Lord. Now we, in our fallibility, might distort what the Bible says, and we need the Spirit's help to understand the Bible aright, and, and now we're getting into kind of how to interpret the Bible, but when we come to a portion of the Bible that's less clear, what do we do given its organic unity? Uh, when we come to a portion of the Bible that's less clear, we should turn to those portions of the Bible on the same subject that are more clear and interpret the less clear in light of the more clear. That's a key principle for interpreting the Bible. We come to the Bible knowing that it is unified, that it has to do with the person and work of Christ. Um, and the reason the Bible is unified is because it's God's speech, and God is one. And there's no conflict in the being of God. And there's no conflict in His Word. Okay, just a couple. I'm holding off on sufficiency. A couple of points of the Bible on perspicuity, just to give us a sense of where this attribute comes from. I'm spending a little more time on it because I think it's so important in our day and age. Uh, after Pentecost, you remember, uh, the apostles pick up all kinds of Old Testament verses, Peter's sermon at Pentecost in Acts 2, for example, and uh, they draw on the Old Testament with great confidence that its meaning would be accessible to those to whom they were preaching. Uh, the apostles believed in the perspicuity of the Old Testament. Luke 24, okay? Remember Luke 24, the road to Emmaus. Jesus meets these two disciples on the road. He's, they're kept from seeing him, understanding who he is. And he's asking them what they're talking about. And they say, are you the only person around here who doesn't know what's happened? with Jesus, performed many signs. Uh, women found his tomb empty. And then Jesus turns and he says, what? How slow of heart. How, how, how 
um, yeah, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Jesus essentially turns to these disciples and says, the Old Testament is clear. And it's your slowness to believe what is essentially clear in the Old Testament that accounts for your lack of faith. Deuteronomy 30, uh, Moses giving this final speech before the people of God enter into the promised land. And he says in verses 12 and 14, For this commandment I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. Verse 14, But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. And then we turn to Romans uh, 10, I believe, and there's kind of a Christological interpretation of this text that says this is the word of faith that we preach to you. It's not hard to understand the gospel. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God who died for sinners that we might live before the face of God. We can understand that message. In fact, um, one writer on a wonderful book called, if you're interested, it's called, running out of space here, A Clear and Present Word. I think it's the best book on perspicuity by Mark Thompson. A Clear and Present Word. In that book, he says, the very fact that the world is offended by the gospel message is the greatest proof that it's clear. And I've always found that to be a very compelling argument. <laughs> the fact that people get upset when you say, you are a sinner in the sight of God in need of a Savior, proves that the Bible's message is clear. Okay. Well, let me pause for a second and just let's think together about the privilege of having the revelatory record of the history of special revelation centered on Christ in our hands, and having as that deposit of God's speech its authority, its necessity, and its essential clarity. And then next week, just didn't have time to get to this, we'll say, has God said enough to us? Has he said enough? Because I think that's kind of where the rubber meets the road for Christians in our circles. Do we really believe that the Bible is enough, or should we go looking elsewhere for how to live, how to worship, that's a big one, uh, how to honor the Lord in all of life. But just for now, what are some of the privileges? Like, when you think about this, maybe even in our contemporary setting, uh, what, what are some of the privileges that come to mind as you think about having the Bible in your hands? Yeah. That we can have assurance, yeah, absolutely. That we don't have to rely on our own memory, but can go again and again and again to the Bible and essentially hear God speaking to us again. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? What do you think? I'm sorry? To be blessed by God, certainly, absolutely. That as we come to know the gospel, we experience the blessing of God. Ronnie? Okay, having the Bible in our hand connects us to Christians over the millennia, right? I mean, one of the most uh, fascinating studies is to study the manuscripts that we have in our possession. I think the oldest manuscript goes back to uh, maybe the early 200s A.D. It's a little fragment of the Gospel of John. But Old Testament uh, scrolls that we can see how painstaking was the care uh, with which uh, people copied the Bible. And we can see that it matches up with our English translations that we have today. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, it, never really, it never runs dry. It's, like it's fresh. It's fresh. Absolutely. You've heard of that wonderful statement that the Bible is so deep that an elephant can swim and a child can play. Uh, how about this? Just the fact that we have the printed word in our own language. Uh, Bible translation. I mentioned some of the statistics earlier. But what a privilege it is that we have the Bible in a language that we can understand. Do you know the vast majority of Christians 
in the centuries past did not have the Bible in their own language. That was a breakthrough, really, of the Reformation. It started out as the New Testament was spoken in Koine Greek, the language of the, the common man. Um, but for the, for the Middle Ages, uh, they were dealing with Latin and a worship service where the priest's back was to the people. And, and if you were a typical medieval European, uh, as many of our ancestors were, not all, I'm sure, uh, you would really be a spectator rather than a participant at the worship service. You would be watching priests do something in a language you did not understand, and then you would leave. But it was really the Reformation that said, no, the Bible needs to be in the tongue of the people and accessible to the people. And men like Wycliffe uh, risked their lives to have the Bible translated and put in the church where the people could read it. And then the proliferation of Bible translation and publication. So that, I mean, fun exercise to go home today and, and see how many Bibles you have in your house. And just know how privileged you are to have multiple copies in your hand of the Bible. And then I think about this Bible program I use called Logos Bible Software. I use it every day, every week. And just how quickly I can look up a word search in Greek or Hebrew in, a, in seconds. I can search an entire book uh, with that word as I'm preaching through Philippians. Just where is joy? You know? Bam. Uh, it's just an amazing privilege. And we shouldn't take it for granted, especially in, in our country as well, because there are places where having a Bible is not allowed. Well, let me pray. And then uh, we'll prepare for next week to dive into Scripture sufficiency, and that'll be fun. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for speaking. We thank you that you are a speaking God, and that when you speak, you speak clearly. Uh, Father, we marvel that language itself is your creation. It is your gift to us, so that you're not hampered at all by the words that you use to communicate with us. Father, thank you that not only have you spoken in ages past, pointing to the Savior, but you've spoken in a Son, in a person, who has come and lived and died and rose again, who authorized his followers to write down what it means that Christ died and rose for us and for our salvation. And Father, thank you that we have the privilege of sitting under the ministry of your word as it goes forth with power and conviction in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can read your Bible at home, that you use it to transform our hearts and to draw us ever closer to yourself. Uh, Father, we pray that we would be a people who would feed upon your word that we would listen with hearts of faith, that we would receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. This is what we need more than anything. We need your word alive in our hearts. Father, we pray uh, that you would do this for your own glory as you assemble your people together before the throne of grace on the last day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.